Good afternoon. Just one item at the top, and then I would be happy to take your questions. The U.S. Department of State and the people of the United States expressed our deepest condolences and sympathy to the people of North Macedonia and Bulgaria, especially to those who lost family members, many of whom were children, in today's bus, accidents, bus accident near Bosnek. We also want to extend our deep condolences to those who lost loved ones in the nursing home fire in Royak. Our hearts go out to all those in mourning, and we wish a speedy recovery to the injured. The United States stands with Bulgaria and North Macedonia at this difficult time. With that, um, Myra. It was, uh, it's been reported that uh, U.S. is considering, U.S. has decided to uh, delist uh, FARC, Colombia. Um, can you confirm that, and you can talk a little bit about the uh, U.S. thinking behind that, please? Well, Humaira, there are certain processes that uh, require consultations and notifications. Uh, and so what I can say in this case is that uh, today the Department of State has uh, provided Congress with notifications of upcoming actions uh, we are taking with regard to the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia or the FARC. Um, as you know, the peace process and uh, the signing of the peace accord uh, five years ago uh, is something that uh, was a seminal turning point in some ways in the long-running Colombia conflict. It's something we've commended. Uh, it is something that uh, we have sought at every step of the way to preserve. Uh, the peace accord ended five decades of conflict uh, with the FARC, uh, and it set Colombia on a path to a just uh, and lasting peace. Uh, and so we remain fully committed uh, to working with our Colombian partners on the implementation of the peace accord. Uh, as you know, we were just in Bogota uh, a couple weeks ago uh, where we met uh, with President Duque. We met with uh, the foreign minister as well uh, and others in the Colombian government. And obviously, uh, the implementation and preservation of the peace accord um, was uh, a central uh, topic in those discussions. Um, I mean, when are you going to finalize this process? I understand it's a process, but it's already been out there that you guys have decided to deal with them. Can you be a little bit more specific? Well, as, as you know better than I, sometimes things are reported that we're not in a position to comment on uh, just yet. But I would imagine in the coming days we'll have more to say on this. Uh, today, unfortunately, I'll just have to say that we have started the process of consulting uh, with Congress on uh, actions. Uh, that we are taking with regard to the FARC, um, but we will have more uh, details on this in the coming days. Nick? Can I have uh, two questions? One, can you comment on this lawsuit that was filed about Keystone yesterday? Uh, TC Energy is uh, claiming $15 billion in damages uh, over the Biden administration decision to cancel the permitting for Keystone. Well, uh, as you know, we don't uh, comment uh, specifically on litigation, but I can say a couple things. I can confirm that we've received a request for arbitration uh, uh, from TC Energy Corporation and Trans Canada Pipelines Limited uh, pur pursuant to Annex 14C of the agreement between the United States of America, United Mexican States, uh, and Canada, USMCA, of course, uh, in Section B of Chapter 11 of NAFTA uh, on November 22nd, yesterday. Uh, Canada is a key U.S. partner in energy as well as in efforts to address climate change and protect the environment. Uh, we look forward to working with Canada to meeting these challenges together. Uh, we will, and uh, uh, we know we must. Uh, we expect to publish the request for arbitration on our website uh, in the coming weeks. And in the meantime, as I said, uh, we're just not in a position to comment on pending litigation. Okay, and then on Nord Stream 2, just to follow up on yesterday's announcement, um, the announcement cited uh, three entities, two that have been sanctioned, Transadria and then its ship, the Marlin, and then another ship that was not mentioned but is in the report uh, called Blue Ship, which was cited but is not being sanctioned. Can, can you say why that second ship, Blue Ship, is not being sanctioned but is being cited? Well, um, let me start at the top uh, and reiterate, as you heard from the Secretary in his statement uh, again yesterday, uh, that we continue to oppose Nord Stream 2. We continue to believe it is harmful, uh, uh, that it is a Russian uh, geopolitical 
uh, project. It's a bad deal for Ukraine. It's a bad deal for Europe. Um, that is precisely why uh, we have worked uh, concertedly uh, with our allies and our partners, including the Ukrainians, uh, including uh, our German allies as well, uh, on a package that we announced several months ago now uh, that will um, mitigate the effects, the pernicious effects uh, of Nord Stream 2. Uh, it's also why we continue to act pursuant to PISA, the Protecting Europe's Energy and Security Act, uh, as amended, even as uh, we have worked uh, with allies and partners to ensure that the pipeline is not allowed to circumvent uh, the certification process and the EU's third energy package, including uh, the various requirements that are spelled out there, uh, requirements for ownership unbundling, the requirements for third-party access to the pipeline, uh, uh, to transit gas from sources other than Russia, other than Gazprom. Um, so these measures, again, with the 2021 joint statement uh, that we released uh, together with our German allies, uh, it certainly reduced the risk of an operational NS2 pipeline. It reduced the risk uh, that such a pipeline would pose to European energy security and the security of Ukraine and frontline NATO and EU countries. Uh, we are uh, as you know, um, we submit a report to Congress every 90 days uh, as we closely monitor uh, developments with regard to Nord Stream 2. Uh, we are closely monitoring sanctionable activity uh, as we collect that information, as we analyze the facts. Uh, we are applying those facts uh, to, the, um, uh, to the requirements laid out uh, in this uh, legislation. And so yesterday, you are correct. Uh, that we did uh, announce two vessels and one Russia-linked entity uh, involved in the Nord Stream 2 pipeline is now falling, uh, falling under uh, our uh, PISA sanctions authority. Uh, and we will continue uh, to follow the law uh, to implement PISA uh, and, as appropriate, the sanction entities involved uh, in the construction but, involved but in the just, pipeline. Just to follow up on that, so why was the blue ship not – why was that cited but not sanctioned? As you know, PISA lays out uh, the requirements. It lays out uh, what we um, are required to do in terms of implementing our sanctions authority. Uh, we have consistently followed the laws. We always do. Uh, we'll continue to do that. Uh, as for uh, the specifics uh, of, a, of a particular uh, vessel or entity, that's just not something I'm, I'm prepared to go into today. Okay, because, I mean, I, I, it was my understanding that it was not sanctioned because it is a German, it is owned by a German foundation, uh, and, that, and so the administration essentially did not want to, uh, like with the Nord Stream 2 AG waiver, did not want to sanction uh, a ship belonging to a German government entity. Well, we have worked very closely with our German allies. I spoke, I spoke already to uh, the uh, joint statement that we released with the Germans, uh, a joint statement that at its heart is about a package of support for uh, our Ukrainian partners and the support uh, that we, uh, together uh, with our German allies, uh, are um, providing to our uh, Ukrainian partners. Um, you know that that package of support uh, entailed uh, various assurances. Uh, it entailed a fund uh, that our Ukrainian partners can tap into uh, to offset uh, some of the potential implications of an operational uh, Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Uh, so this has been a topic of uh, intense diplomacy. Uh, and had been a topic of intense diplomacy and still is a topic of conversation with our German allies. Uh, it's something that uh, we regularly discuss with our Ukrainian partners, Nord Stream 2 specifically, but also uh, Ukraine's energy security uh, and the imperative uh, of ensuring that Ukraine is not uh, held um, hostage to the whims of uh, any other uh, country when it comes to energy. Right, and just the last thing for me, then. So, I mean, are you at all worried that, I mean, what appears to have happened in this case is you had a ship that was working on Nord Stream 2 on the construction of the pipeline, uh, and then as a way of avoiding sanctions, the beneficial ownership of that ship was essentially transferred to a German government entity under the knowledge that by doing so it would avoid sanctions. So, I mean, are you worried that there is a loophole here that, uh, companies working on Nord Stream 2 could essentially exploit given this administration's unwillingness to sanction entities that are in any way affiliated with the German government? Uh, Nick, we have uh, sanctioned uh, and consistently applied uh, PISA as it is written. We have now sanctioned eight persons. 
identified 17 of their vessels uh, as blocked property pursuant uh, to PISA in connection with Nord Stream 2. As I was saying before, we'll continue to examine entities uh, engaged in potentially sanctionable activity uh, in line uh, with our commitment, and it is a commitment uh, to implement uh, PISA. So again, I'm not uh, in a position from here to go into the details of uh, shifts, entities, um, but uh, rest assured, um, PISA is something we are committed to, uh, continuing to demonstrate our opposition to Nord Stream 2 uh, and our commitment to Ukraine's energy security uh, is something uh, we will continue to do. Okay. I wanted to ask you about Russia, Ukraine, if you, uh, since your, all your warnings uh, over the last uh, week and, and days. Um, I think there was a call today between the chief of staff. Has there been any diplomatic engagement? Uh, has uh, the secretary spoken with his uh, counterpart, Sergei Lavrov? And are you still worried about uh, what's going on at the border between Ukraine and, and Russia, or are you less worried than you were one week ago? Well, nothing about our concern has changed. Uh, you heard the secretary reiterate that concern over the weekend uh, on his travels. I spoke to this yesterday as well. Uh, the unusual, uh, the reports of the un unusual Russian military activity uh, near Ukraine's borders, along Ukraine's borders, uh, is a cause for concern. It's a cause for concern for the United States. It's a cause for concern for our Ukrainian partners. It's also a cause for concern uh, for our European allies as well. Uh, that is why in recent weeks we have had extensive uh, consultations uh, and engaged in concerted diplomacy uh, with not only Ukraine but also our European allies. Um, during many of these meetings we've discussed our concerns about Russia's military activities, uh, its harsh rhetoric towards uh, Ukraine, uh, its actions in the past, uh, and I think the allusion to the past is important here. Uh, because, yes, uh, we, uh, there are reports of unusual military activity, but that unusual military activity doesn't come in, in a vacuum. It comes in the context uh, of the Russian Federation that in 2014, some seven years ago, uh, undertook similar activities uh, only to amass forces along the border and then to falsely, uh, speciously claim uh, protectual provocation uh, and to cross that border uh, illegally, uh, continuing its aggression uh, against Ukraine. Uh, so we've held discussions with Russian officials uh, as well in the context of all of this. We've spoken publicly uh, to some of those engagements. Many of those engagements have uh, come out of this building. Some of those engagements have uh, taken place out of uh, other buildings, including uh, the National Security Council has read out some of those engagements. As you know, uh, the intelligence community and uh, CIA Director Burns' travel uh, to Moscow um, uh, took place in, in, recent, uh, in recent weeks. Um, in all of this, um, our engagement with our European allies, with our Ukrainian partners. Uh, we have underscored our rock-solid commitment uh, to Ukraine's uh, sovereignty, uh, to, um, uh, uh, to Ukraine's security. Uh, and we've also made clear, um, both with our allies and with the Russian Federation, that any escalatory or aggressive moves by Russia would be of great concern to the United States. Uh, and we've called for an immediate restoration of the July 2020 ceasefire in Donbass. And is there any discussion, decision, or imminent decision about um, sending more weapons to Ukraine as they often request? Well, uh, as you know, we are uh, in regular consultation uh, and dialogue with our Ukrainian partners about their uh, defensive needs. Uh, we don't have anything to announce or preview at this time, but uh, we announced that we'd be sending more than $60 million in security assistance during President Zelensky's visit uh, to the U.S. earlier this year uh, in uh, late August, I believe it was, uh, as part of our uh, strategic partnership uh, with Ukraine. And we've sent more than $400 million uh, overall this year to support Ukraine's uh, sovereignty. Since the beginning of this administration, we've demonstrated that uh, we are uh, willing and able to use a number of tools uh, to address uh, Russia's harmful activities, and we won't hesitate uh, from making use of those tools as appropriate uh, in the future as well. Andrea. What do you draw from the fact that Russia so far is ignoring all of this pressure, all of your calls, all of the international diplomacy? Well, again, uh, we don't know uh, Russia's intentions. Uh, we don't know uh, precisely what Vladimir Putin 
uh, and the Kremlin might be planning. Uh, but we do know a couple things. Uh, we do know what has been observed, including in public accounts, about this unusual Russian military activity along the border. Uh, we do know the history, uh, and that history uh, is not at all reassuring in terms of uh, previous steps that the Russian Federation uh, took in 2014 that in some ways looked at least similar uh, to this and led to an outcome uh, that um, uh, was deeply disturbing uh, in terms of the military aggression uh, against Ukraine. Uh, so we are taking all of that. Uh, we are uh, comparing what is in uh, what we have in our holdings. We are sharing information. We are sharing intelligence. Uh, with our European allies, with Ukraine as well. Uh, of course, the foreign minister uh, was here just the other week uh, and had an opportunity to meet directly with Secretary Blinken uh, and his team, uh, just as Secretary Blinken had an opportunity to meet, uh, as did President Biden, with President Zelensky uh, in Scotland at COP26. We also saw uh, the foreign minister uh, at COP26, where this was uh, a subject as well. So uh, it is not for us to say what uh, the Russian Federation may be planning. It is for us to say uh, what we're doing in response. Uh, and we are engaged in concerted diplomacy. We are making sure uh, through a number of ways uh, that our European allies know, that Ukraine knows, and importantly, that the Russian Federation knows, uh, that our commitment to Ukraine's sovereignty uh, to its independence, to its territorial integrity, uh, is rock solid. Is there a red line, and do you have uh, any proposals to bring to either the NATO ministerial or to the OSCE meeting? Look, uh, we will take advantage of every opportunity we have, including multilateral opportunities that may be coming up in the coming days, uh, including potentially with NATO, uh, to make uh, very clear our concerns, to share concerns, to compare notes uh, with our uh, NATO allies as well. Uh, the bottom line for us is clear. Any escalatory or aggressive actions uh, would be of great concern to the United States, uh, but it would not just be of concern to us, it would be of great concern we have uh, heard, you have heard, uh, to our European allies uh, as well. Uh, yes? Um, this one, Russia. Sure. Um, I just want to push back a little bit on what you're saying. Um, so you're consulting with your allies, so all of you guys are sitting in rooms having Zoom calls and telling each other, like, we don't know what Russia is intending to do. We have no idea what they're doing. I mean, this is, I'm sorry, this is respectfully, this is a little bit, un, you know, unthinkable. Well, like, respectfully, so that, respectfully, that's I mean, what I'm telling you. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying that we're but I mean, saying know, that. It's, yeah, uh, but it's just like we don't know what Russia is intending to do. That's just, it, certainly you have an assessment, and certainly you guys must be working on certain scenarios. Because otherwise, if you have no idea what they're doing, then it, doesn't that mean that U.S. is not prepared for what's coming? Right? Uh, we are prepared and preparing for a number of contingencies. Okay. And you can understand why uh, the level of detail that I offer here uh, is, of course, going to be consistent uh, with what we say in private, but it probably will not be uh, as extensive, and it certainly won't be as extensive uh, as uh, our, our private consultations with our uh, European allies, with our Ukrainian partners. Uh, those consultations are ongoing. I can assure you uh, it, is not, um, uh, it is not as you characterized it. Uh, these are in-depth conversations uh, we have sent uh, senior officials from the department to provide detailed briefings uh, to our European allies. We've provided detailed information uh, to Ukraine as well, uh, and we will continue not only to share information, uh, but to prepare uh, for a range of contingencies. I can assure you that's what we're doing. And those contingencies involve the repeat of 2014? I, look, it's not prudent for me to go into that from here, um, but it is prudent for us uh, to engage in a, in a broad range of contingency planning. Can I follow up on that sure. So, um, if you guys are, you know, getting at contingency options, um, clearly you've made a calculation that it's not uh, in the U.S. and European interest to um, lay those out explicitly. So, why are you making that calculation? What is the benefit of keeping those contingencies close held and not publicly uh, told as a deterrent? to what Russia is doing? Well, uh, in some ways, uh, the fact that we are speaking about this 
uh, openly. Uh, the fact that we are acknowledging our concerns, the fact that we have made no secret uh, of our consultations uh, with Ukraine, uh, with our European partners, the fact that uh, we have not been shy in voicing our concerns about uh, what we're seeing now, the public reports uh, and um, uh, information we have about Russia's unusual military activities, uh, and uh, layering that on top of what we saw in 2014. Uh, we are saying all of this to make clear uh, not only uh, to Ukraine uh, our rock-solid commitment, but also to uh, the Ru Russian Federation. Uh, and you've seen similar statements uh, from some of our European allies. You've uh, seen statements from uh, Ukraine uh, as well when it comes to this. Um, look, it is not prudent for us to go into great detail uh, about precisely uh, the sort of information we have, precisely uh, the planning uh, and um, uh, consultations that we're engaging in with uh, our allies and partners, uh, but that is uh, taking place, uh, and it is part of a prudent preparatory uh, process uh, so that we would be able to address a range of scenarios. Uh, we do know that uh, Russia's aggression against Ukraine, uh, it was not a one-time event in 2014. Of course, Russia's illegal op occupation of Crimea uh, and its presence in eastern Ukraine continues. Of course, uh, its aggression in terms of rhetoric, uh, in terms of uh, other uh, potentially hybrid actions, uh, have continued. Uh, so all of that is a cause for great concern. Uh, and that is also why we have continued to stand by Ukraine, to stand by them not only rhetorically, rhetorically is important, um, including for um, reasons of uh, potentially deterrence, uh, but also the security assistance that we've provided. Uh, the $60 million that was announced in the context of President Zelensky's visit, the $400 million uh, that has been committed uh, to our Ukrainian partners uh, since the start of this administration. So, just, so um, if they don't respond to um, what you guys are pointing out publicly, at some point will you explicitly say what your physical response is going to be? Our, it's not there yet? Our, our public statements uh, will be calibrated uh, based on what we see, but more importantly, uh, the actions we take, the steps we take, uh, will be pursuant uh, to what we see. Uh, right now, we're engaged in diplomacy. Uh, we are speaking uh, openly uh, to what we're seeing. Uh, we're acknowledging uh, the process in which we're engaged. Uh, and pursuant to what we see on the ground or what we don't see on the ground, uh, we'll change our rhetoric. We'll change potentially our actions as well. And last question. The $60 million in security assistance that was announced over the summer, um, what portion of that has already gone to Ukraine? And when should we expect that uh, to be fully delivered? Well, the, our embassy in Kiev, uh, even in recent day, uh, days, has uh, issued tweets about various deliveries, uh, including of uh, certain defensive weapon systems. Uh, so uh, we have made uh, those deliveries public, uh, and I think from that you can get a sense of, of the, the pace and the scope of the provision of, uh, of material that's been supplied. Okay. Yes, love. Continuing on Russia, but India last week, Russia started supplying F-400. I know previously U.S. has asked, requested India not to receive it from them because the Carta sanctions have come into play. Can you give us a status now? How has Carta sanctions come into play in India, and what is going to be the U.S. stand on that? Well, we would need to refer you to uh, the Indian government uh, for any comments on potential deliveries of the S-400 system. Um, but we have been clear when it comes to this system, not only in the Indian context, but more broadly as well, uh, that we've urged all of our allies, all of our partners, to forego transactions with Russia uh, that may risk triggering uh, sanctions under uh, so-called CATSA, the Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act. Uh, we have not made a determination on a potential waiver uh, with respect to Indian arms transactions with Russia. Uh, CATSA, however, does not have a blanket or country-specific uh, waiver provision attached to it. Uh, we also know that our defense relationship with India has expanded and deepened uh, significantly in recent years. It's deepened commensurate uh, with the broad and uh, deep relationship uh, that we have with India and its status as a major defense partner. Uh, we expect this strong momentum in our uh, defense relationship 
uh, to continue. Uh, we certainly value our strategic partnership with India. As you know, we had an opportunity uh, to uh, travel to uh, India not all that long ago. In August, I believe it was, we've met with Foreign Minister Jai Shankar uh, many times. Uh, we have uh, discussed this concern uh, directly, uh, including with the highest levels of the Indian government. Yeah, uh, but it's a public knowledge now that India has started receiving since last week the S-400 missile system. Uh, so do you want Indian government to tell you formally that they have started receiving it? I mean, so how does it work? Well, again, it's not for us to speak to any systems that the Indian government may or may not have received. Uh, it is for us to speak to uh, the laws that are on the books uh, and the requirements uh, under those laws. Uh, obviously, uh, members of Congress uh, are uh, deeply interested uh, in this as well. Uh, so it's a conversation that has been ongoing with our Indian partners. It's a conversation uh, that takes place in the context of a defense relationship uh, that is meaningful to us, that is important both to the United States uh, and India, including in the context of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, and so I suspect those conversations will continue. And is it because of these differences that the 2 plus 2 has been now pushed to January or next year? Uh, we, we have never announced a date for the 2 plus 2. Uh, of course, we've committed to the 2 plus 2, again, because uh, we have um, a significant relationship uh, with India, including its status as a major defense partner. Um, but I uh, can assure you that uh, there will be an opportunity for a 2 plus 2 uh, before long. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Sure. In the beginning of this administration, uh, the U.S. has said that climate change would be at the forefront of diplomacy, mm -hmm. uh, that it would be a priority. Yet, the U.S. continues to be silent regarding a bill uh, that is pushed by the Mexican government openly that would kill the renewables market in Mexico. Uh, U.S. senators, U.S. governors, U.S. House members have asked through different letters to the administration, asked uh, for a firm commitment and publicly acknowledged this concerning development. Is the U.S. willing to defend renewables companies from the U.S. that have invested billions in the market in Mexico to defend uh, against these potential actions, or, or is climate change not a priority for you? Well, uh, climate change certainly is a priority for us. Uh, it is a priority we have heard and you have heard uh, for the Mexican government as well. Uh, it has to be. Uh, both the United States and Mexico uh, are nations that historically have uh, been large emitters. Uh, of course, the United States is one of the world's largest. Mexico, too, um, uh, contributes uh, and has contributed a fair amount uh, of um, of uh, pollution into the atmosphere. Uh, and so this has to be a priority uh, for both of our countries. And I think you've seen concrete, uh, concrete steps that both Washington and Mexico City have taken uh, to acknowledge uh, the centrality of uh, uh, climate action. I'm in both sorry, but it, but it was not discussed during the North American Leader Summit, and even the U.S. Envoy for Climate, Mr. Kerry, when he visited Mexico, he didn't mention this concerning development about renewables. Is, is the specific issue of the bill concerning to the U.S., and will it be willing to defend U.S. companies that have billions? Well, the, uh, the good news is that we have a very strong uh, relationship uh, with our Mexican counterparts. Uh, that strong relationship allows us uh, to speak frankly and directly uh, with our Mexican counterparts about potential areas of concern. Uh, we do, when it comes to energy sector reform, we welcome Mexico's recent commitment to uh, tackle the climate crisis uh, and to accelerate, to accelerate uh, renewable energy development. Uh, and we continue to engage uh, with the government to better understand its vision uh, for realizing these commitments and to discuss a range of energy, energy sector issues affecting uh, private and public sector uh, investments. Uh, the fact is, of course, Mexico uh, is a sovereign country. It's going to make sovereign decisions uh, over its energy sector. Uh, but we continue to advocate for open and transparent procurement processes. Uh, we trust that Mexico will uh, fulfill its international commitments in that regard. Uh, we've uh, been very clear, um, including uh, in bilateral settings, uh, with our Mexican counterparts about our concerns. Uh, promoting the use of, in some cases, dirtier, uh, of, in some cases, more expensive technologies uh, over cheaper uh, renewable technologies um, will make it more difficult to achieve the, sh the climate goals that have to be shared priorities uh, between our two countries. 
Uh, and we also have communicated to our Mexican partners that the private sector has an important role to play. Uh, it has an important role to play in helping the government achieve its goal of enhancing Mexico's ener energy independence while moving forward uh, with uh, a, a green agenda, uh, um, uh, greening its energy sector and advancing uh, economic prosperity at the same time, because we know uh, that these two things often uh, go hand in hand. So uh, with our Mexican uh, partners, we're able to work on uh, areas of mutual interest uh, together. Uh, we're able to have frank uh, conversations where there are areas of disagreement. Um, we continue to discuss uh, accelerating the adoption of clean, of, uh, clean energy, uh, ensuring reliable energy supply, and promoting energy affordability. And well. about U.S. security, sorry, about security of U.S. tourists in Mexico. Uh, the Mayan Riviera, where Can the Cancun Resort is located, is suffering one of the worst crises of violence of recent years. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had these uh, high-profile uh, incidents, like the shooting in a hotel in Cancun and the killing of two tourists in, in Tulum, including one U.S. resident. Uh, is the U.S. concerned about security of U.S. citizens that travel to Cancun, perhaps more than in anywhere in the world? And are you considering raising the threat level in your advisories from two to three? Well, uh, as you know, we have no higher priority than the safety and security of Americans uh, around the world. Uh, that includes in Mexico. We have seen incidents uh, of violence. Our uh, embassy in Mexico, our, our posts uh, throughout the country continue uh, to monitor uh, all sources of information, continue to work closely with the Mexican government. Uh, if our assessment of the risks of the travel of American citizens to Mexico should change, uh, we will not hesitate uh, to update relevant advisories and to provide information uh, and uh, information for due diligence uh, to Americans who may be in Mexico or who are contemplating uh, travel to Mexico. But when it comes to security challenges broadly, uh, Mexico remains uh, a, uh, a close uh, security partner. Uh, we are committed to working with uh, the Lopez Obrador administration uh, to advance um, Mexico's ability to fight corruption, to fight impunity, uh, to implement more effective strategies, to uh, do what is in uh, our mutual and shared interests. And that includes dismantling transnational organi organized crime operations, uh, including through uh, law enforcement uh, operations in cooperation in Mexico. And that will continue. Thank you. I tried a version of this from the Secretary in the car. It was a really multi-part question, uh, but he didn't really address it, so I just wanted to try uh, to get your response to President Putin, back on Russia, President Putin's uh, comments, I think now uh, last week, uh, saying that uh, the U.S. was not respecting Russia's red lines, and there have been other Russian officials complaining that U.S. activity has been threatening and, and intimidating strategic bomber runs near Russia's airspace, exercises in the Black Sea. Um, do you want to just comment on this? I mean, does Russia have any legitimate grounds to be feeling uh, aggrieved or intimidated by military exercises by the U.S. and NATO? And, and what's your response to the claim that we are uh, coming dangerously close to Russian red lines? Well, my colleague at the Pentagon, I'm sure, can give you more uh, details on certain military exercises uh, that are uh, taking place. As you know, our exercises are uh, routine and, and, and defensive in nature. Uh, what I can tell you, uh, and I can't speak to any red lines that Mr. Putin or the Russian Federation may have, I can tell you that uh, what we do, whether it is in Eastern Europe, uh, whether it's in the Indo-Pacific, uh, whether it's in uh, our hemisphere, uh, is that we stand up for the rules-based international order. Uh, that, to us, is what is important. Uh, and there are a number of precepts uh, that uh, fall within that, including uh, a very uh, fundamental point, and that is that big countries uh, cannot bully the small ones, uh, that uh, borders um, are um, uh, not to be crossed, not to be violated, uh, that international uh, waters uh, are um, uh, available for uh, free navigation uh, by all countries. These are the basic fundamental uh, properties of the rules-based international order. That's what we're standing up for. That's what we're defending. Uh, it is not that we have our sights on any particular country. Uh, it is that uh, we are doing everything we can, together with our allies, together with our partners, uh, to reinforce the system, the rules-based system, uh, and international order that has worked to uh, the mutual benefit, mutual prosperity, 
security uh, of uh, the international community for the past 70 years or so. Um, that is what, um, uh, whether it's uh, Ukraine, whether it's Russia, uh, whether it's the Indo-Pacific, uh, that we are, uh, we are undertaking. administration perspective, what would be a positive outcome of the Vienna talks on Monday? Well, um, as you know, we have been encouraging the resumption of talks uh, for months now. Uh, there was uh, a good amount of progress. In the previous six round of talks, uh, there has been a multi-month pause uh, in those talks uh, in Vienna uh, since the new government uh, in Iran uh, was installed. Uh, so it is our hope that uh, the new government in Iran uh, shows up in Vienna and ready, uh, shows up in Vienna ready to negotiate uh, in good faith to build on the progress that had been achieved in the previous six round uh, of uh, negotiations. It is, we continue to believe that a mutual return to compliance with the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, uh, it is uh, the best, it's the most effective uh, means by which to reapply those uh, permanent and verifiable restrictions on Iran's uh, nuclear program uh, permanently, preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, a previous Iranian government had also calculated uh, that the JCPOA and the formula that it brings to the table, uh, a uh, permanent and verifiable halt uh, to certain nuclear activities in return for um, uh, an easing of certain sanctions, uh, was a recipe that uh, was in their interest as well. Uh, so we hope that this Iranian government, uh, at the very least, uh, shows up in Vienna ready to take part in those discussions with the other members of the P5 plus one uh, in good faith uh, and seeking to build on the progress that we had made previously uh, in those prior rounds. And it, yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm just wondering if the Biden administration is considering any confidence building measures to grease the wheels for these continuous talks. We've been very clear that we are uh, not prepared to take unilateral steps uh, solely for the benefit of greasing the wheel, uh, as you said. Uh, we are prepared to engage in a mutual return to compliance uh, with the JCPOA. Uh, that is what we have made very clear since April, I believe, uh, that we have sought to do. Uh, and we hope that we see uh, the same serious, seriousness of purpose uh, from the Iranians uh, when they return to Vienna next week. Ben. Yeah, if I could just follow up. Uh, in August, President Biden said if diplomacy fails, the U.S. had other options. I'm just wondering if you could share what those options are. And to just follow up on what Kylie was asking, um, if the new Iranian government do not come this round to negotiate in good faith, uh, after this round, is it time to start implementing those other options? And then I have a, another question on China. Well, I wouldn't want to engage in a hypothetical. Again, uh, our hope continues to be, and we'll soon have a verdict on this, uh, that this new Iranian government shows up in Vienna ready to negotiate in good faith uh, and um, with uh, clarity of purpose uh, to see to it that we can effect a mutual return to compliance with uh, the JCPOA. Look, uh, the President, uh, the National Security Advisor, Secretary Blinken, have all been uh, very clear that uh, diplomacy uh, remains our preferred course and diplomacy in the form of uh, testing whether we can achieve a mutual return to compliance remains our preferred course. And it remains our preferred course uh, specifically because we continue to believe that the JCPOA offers a framework uh, that will permanently and verifiably prevent Iran from ever obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, that is what we want to see. Uh, that is what uh, our allies and partners uh, want to see as well. Uh, and we'll see in the coming days um, what exactly this approach the uh, new Iranian uh, government will seek to take. But we've also been very clear that uh, this is not a process that can go on indefinitely. And if the Iranians, through their actions or through their inactions, uh, demonstrate or suggest that they lack that um, good faith, that they lack that clarity of purpose, uh, we'll have to turn to uh, other means. Uh, we have a variety of other means. We're discussing those. Uh, with our allies and partners uh, in the category of things that aren't prudent to discuss from here, that's that's one of them. And can I ask about the Beijing Olympics real quick? I know you answered a few questions yesterday. You are welcome to ask. Okay. Um, you mentioned yesterday that there were a range of issues 
Uh, when it comes to U.S. decision on whether or not to do a diplomatic boycott, you mentioned Xinjiang and human rights. Mm -hmm. uh, how much will the recent incident with uh, the tennis player Peng Shui be a factor in your considerations? And then also, is the State Department talking to allies, p partners, like-minded countries about uh, doing a boycott, you know, as a group of countries or just the U.S. alone? Uh, look, we have spoken to our concerns with uh, Peng Shui, uh, and we continue to monitor this very closely. Uh, obviously, there has been uh, footage, there has been uh, statements uh, that have emerged, uh, uh, including from uh, the Women's Tennis Association, uh, but we continue to monitor this case uh, very closely. Um, precisely because of not only the, the circumstances here, but also because of the broader principle at play. Uh, and that is uh, one of support for the ability of any individual uh, to report sexual assaults and to seek uh, accountability uh, and to know that that report will be investigated and to have that confidence uh, without fear of reprisal, without fear of intimidation, uh, without fear uh, of harassment. Uh, and it's especially concerning in the PRC context to see this because we know that the PRC has a track record uh, of zero tolerance uh, for criticism and a record of silencing those uh, who would dare to uh, speak out. Look, when it comes to the separate issue uh, of the Olympics, uh, there are a range of factors, uh, including uh, issues of uh, human rights abuses, uh, including what uh, we have seen take place and what we are seeing take place uh, in the context of uh, Shenzhen. Uh, we have been nothing but clear about uh, what has and what is taking place in Shenzhen. Uh, we've taken a number of actions uh, in response to the ongoing genocide uh, and other uh, human rights abuses uh, in Shenzhen. Uh, so all of this uh, will weigh on our decision-making when it comes to the Olympics, but I don't have anything further for you today. And is the U.S. Uh, looking to see if other countries would be willing to join them? In our like concerns that? when it comes to the PRC's uh, track record uh, on human rights is something that we have discussed at great length uh, with virtually all uh, of our allies uh, and partners, and it's a concern that we have heard shared uh, by virtually all, uh, if not all, of our allies and partners. Uh, but again, I just don't have anything additional on our uh, posture vis-a-vis -vis the Olympics, Andrea. Can you clarify what the American might be, or uh, whether the IOC call was legitimately a proof of life? I, I would need to refer you to the IOC. I would need to refer you to the Women's Tennis Association uh, for uh, those details. But we are monitoring uh, the case very closely. Don't we have, in, don't we have our own means of verifying things? Uh, as a general matter, we do, but often we don't speak uh, to uh, those means or uh, to uh, the information well, we you may have. Are you confident she is well? I, again, I, I would refer those questions to the ISC and to the Women's Tennis Association. Michael. A question for a colleague who, who can't be here. Um, on Honduras and the Honduran elections on Sunday, after Assistant Secretary Nichols' visit and the recent state of political violence, including his candidates, does the U.S. believe these elections can be free and fair? Uh, well, we have um, been very clear about the need for uh, free and fair uh, elections in Honduras. We've been very uh, clear about uh, our concerns uh, when it comes to um, uh, what we've seen. I think we'll have more to say on the Honduran elections as they approach over. Um, just one final thing around, and then I'll ask about Afghanistan. Um, this has been out there for a while, but just because the talks are starting next week, are you guys at all sympathetic to an interim deal? Uh, we are sympathetic to testing the proposition as to whether we can achieve a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. Uh, that remains uh, our preference uh, precisely because uh, it remains the best means by which to uh, see to it that Iran is permanently and verifiably prevented from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, it is not prudent for us to uh, entertain hypotheticals, to entertain contingencies, um, precisely because we have an opportunity in less than a week now uh, to test uh, the, uh, whether this new Iranian government uh, will negotiate in good faith, and we'll know more after that. Do you have a specific time frame in mind next week, like we're going to keep at it for three days, five days, to see this good faith? How uh, long is it going to take you to see this good faith? A couple of minutes? Well, uh, one of the complications, uh, uh, unfortunately, is that these are indirect yes. uh, discussions with the Iranians. 
so this is a process that uh, in some ways has to be iterative. Uh, it's a process that uh, will require uh, deep consultations uh, with our P5 plus one uh, partners uh, in Vienna. Um, they will, in the first instance, have a sense of uh, what the new government, the approach the new government is taking, uh, and we will uh, continue to engage uh, closely with them. Uh, and this, of course, is something that we've done uh, since the sixth round concluded months and months ago. Uh, as you know, uh, President Biden uh, convened, or President Biden, I should say, took part uh, in a meeting of uh, the uh, E3 plus one uh, when we were in Europe uh, the other week to discuss uh, the status of uh, nuclear talks uh, and Iran's nuclear program. Uh, Secretary Blinken uh, has had an opportunity to uh, discuss Iran's uh, concerning nuclear activity uh, with our uh, European allies, with other members of the P5 plus one, including uh, the PRC, uh, not all that long ago uh, during our last trip uh, to Europe as well. And of course, Rob Malley. Uh, was uh, recently in uh, the Middle East. He was recently uh, meeting with uh, the E3 political directors as well, along with our Israeli partners in the GCC. Uh, so even while we've been on this unfortunate pause, uh, we have had an opportunity to continue to compare notes, to continue to uh, share uh, our concerns, and these are shared concerns, uh, with our allies uh, and partners who are in the P5 plus one and who are not. On Afghanistan, um, just last week, UN envoy said ISIS-K is basically now present in nearly all 34 provinces. I'm just wondering if that's the U.S. assessment also. And can you talk a little bit about if there is any progress with the neighboring countries for over-the-horizon CT operations? Tom was, um, you know, he had talks last week with in Pakistan. Well, I would refer. I would need to refer to uh, my intelligence community or my uh, DoD colleagues to offer an assessment as to. ISIS's presence uh, throughout uh, the country. But what I can say, uh, and you saw another concrete demonstration of this with the designations we announced a couple days ago, uh, that we are committed to countering ISIS-K and ensuring that Afghanistan never again uh, becomes a safe haven for uh, terrorism. Uh, we're working with uh, our international partners, including under the auspices of the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS, uh, to deny the group, uh, as you saw the other day, access to financing. Uh, to disrupt, to deter foreign terrorist fighters uh, from reaching Afghanistan and the region, uh, as just as we are continuing uh, using multiple tools to counter ISIS-K's uh, pernicious ideology. Uh, we are committed to disrupting uh, illicit financing, limiting their abilities to conduct further attacks against civilians, uh, and supporting our partners in counterterrorism and disrupting terrorism uh, finance. It is absolutely a priority of ours. Uh, to see to it uh, that Afghanistan can uh, never again emerge as a launching pad uh, for these operations that may pose a threat to the United States, that could pose a threat uh, to um, our allies and partners around the world. Uh, just as we have uh, discussed uh, this counterterrorism agenda, this counter-ISIS uh, agenda uh, with our allies and partners under the auspices of the, of the Global Coalition uh, and through other means, we've also uh, discussed this directly uh, with the Taliban. We've consistently said uh, we are prepared to engage the Taliban on a practical, pragmatic basis uh, on areas uh, of core national interest uh, to us. And of course, counterterrorism and seeing to it that Afghanistan can never again be used as a, as a launch pad for international attacks uh, is a core national interest. And so we have remained uh, in contact with the Taliban uh, on these issues. I can confirm that next week, uh, Special Representative for Afghanistan, Tom West, uh, he'll return to Doha for two weeks of meetings with Taliban leaders there. Uh, they'll discuss, uh, as I said before, our vital national interests when it comes to Afghanistan. Uh, that includes counterterrorism. Uh, that includes safe passage for U.S. citizens and for Afghans uh, to whom we have uh, a special commitment. Uh, and that includes humanitarian assistance uh, and the economic uh, situation uh, of the country, that too uh, will be a priority uh, area of conversation with them. Uh, Tom West has been on the job now for I think some six weeks, uh, and in that time he's already uh, been um, uh, busy just before he was named to this role. As you recall, he traveled uh, to Doha uh, to meet uh, directly with uh, the Taliban as part of an interagency delegation. Uh, he not all that long ago traveled to uh, Europe and Russia and India 
um, to discuss the way forward on Afghanistan with uh, our allies uh, and partners. Uh, in many of those conversations, uh, we discussed those, those issues that are of core national interest to us, counterterrorism, uh, safe passage, uh, but again, a key theme was uh, humanitarian assistance and what the United States, together with the international community, uh, might do to alleviate the humanitarian uh, plight that, um, uh, that now confronts uh, the people of Afghanistan. Uh, for our part, we've spoken of the humanitarian assistance that the United States has pledged to Afghanistan, $474 million uh, in this year alone. What we are doing to facilitate uh, the provision of humanitarian aid and assistance uh, to the people uh, of uh, Afghanistan, uh, not only through our direct provision of assistance to our uh, um, third partners on the ground, uh, but also the steps uh, that we are taking, including the issu issuance of specific and general licenses uh, to make clear that uh, humanitarian assistance to the people of Afghanistan is something uh, that uh, we strongly support. Final question in the back, sure. From Indo-Pacific. Um, one is for, on Quad, next meeting with uh, Quad in Tokyo. Um, do you have any update on uh, when in, in next year will be held, uh, in, on what level, um, uh, in what form, virtual or in person, uh, such, uh, such details? And one on the trilateral meeting. Uh, held last week uh, between U.S., Japan, and R.K., and the bilateral meeting uh, between Japan and U.S. In the readout <coughs> of those meetings, uh, you have met mentioned about the discussion on Indo-Pacific, but didn't use uh, adjectives of free and open. Why was that? I'm just curious why... Um, the readout refrain from using those terms? Uh, there, there's been no uh, policy shift. Certainly uh, a, a, a primary goal, um, not only of the United States, um, but of our allies and partners, and that includes uh, the three uh, uh, allies and partners we have in the Quad context, uh, is the preservation, is the promotion of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, a free and open Indo-Pacific uh, rules-based international order, uh, as I was uh, mentioned to Michael, mentioning to Michael before, uh, is something that uh, we seek to promote and to protect, protect uh, the world over. So every time we meet with our treaty allies in the Indo-Pacific, every time we meet uh, in a multilateral setting, whether it's uh, with the Quad, whether it's with our ASEAN partners, uh, whether it is uh, in any other context, uh, the free and open uh, Indo-Pacific is really at the heart uh, of everything uh, that we are seeking to do uh, when it comes to uh, that region. I can assure you uh, that it was really the core context uh, of our meetings, uh, of our meeting uh, and Secretary Sherman, Deputy Secretary Sherman's meeting uh, the other day with her uh, Japanese counterpart, but also with her uh, Korean counterpart as well, uh, including in the trilateral meeting. And on Quad. Uh, we don't have uh, the next iteration of that to announce, but as you know, uh, the Quad is indispensable uh, to our efforts to uphold uh, that very concept of free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, Secretary Blinken has had an opportunity to hold a uh, ministerial uh, Quad meeting. President Biden uh, has now had an opportunity both on a virtual basis and in person uh, to meet with his Quad counterparts, so uh, I can assure you uh, that we'll find additional opportunities to meet. Uh, as a quad, uh, but we will also find additional opportunities uh, to meet on a bilateral basis with our uh, treaty allies, uh, with our partners in the Indo-Pacific, uh, and, and in other multilateral fora, uh, just knowing how pivotal and important uh, this region is uh, to our interests, uh, to our values, and to the interests and values uh, that we share uh, with our allies and partners in the region. Thank you all very much.